Welcome to the Half Blood Report. The place for Percy Jackson news, interviews, and all things Riordan. I'm Samuel, your co host. And I'm Diego, your other co host. And today on the podcast, we have a very special guest. John Rocco has made pretty much every piece of cover art for Rick Riordan's books, and he has also illustrated Percy Jackson's Great Gods, Percy Jackson's Great Heroes, and the Lightning Thief Illustrated Edition. Uh, John has been so nice and willing to come on and do an interview with us. John, I'm a huge fan of your work. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, Diego, Samuel, I appreciate you having me here. Yeah, we're, we're so glad to have you on as well. Um, so without uh, further ado, um, could you tell us a little bit about how you landed the job to illustrate the Percy Jackson covers? Yeah, well, that, that's actually an interesting story. Um, what happened for me was I was in the midst of switching careers. Uh, I, was, I was an art director in Los Angeles uh, working in the entertainment field, and I had just moved back from uh, Los Angeles to New York City. And I was trying to find work as a children's book author, illustrator, what have you. And I went to the book expo uh, where I ran into an old friend of mine. We worked together on my very first book that I did back in 1991 um, called Alice, um, which was written by Whoopi Goldberg. And it was a picture book that we did. And the editor was a guy named Rob Weisbach. And he worked for a company called Miramax Books. And he was the only one I knew in the publishing world. And I thought, let me find out if he still works there. <laughs> and so I went over to the booth. Uh, we hadn't seen each other in probably 12, 15 years. Uh, immediately recognized each other. And he said, John Rocco, have I got a great project for you? And so he said, we have this book called The Lightning Thief. Um, it has a cover, um, which if you guys are familiar with the original cover of The Lightning Thief, um, and he said, we, we need a new cover. And so he gave me a copy of the book, and I went in to meet the editor, um, who, who was uh, Jen Besser, and uh, I sketched out a few ideas after reading the book, and uh, the rest is kind of history. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I think wow. e e uh, no matter how much nostalgia people might have for the original, original cover, I think your work pro def definitely brings uh, the Percy Jacks world so much more to life. Oh, thanks. I always find yeah. it interesting because um, when people say that, because to me, the books are very funny. And my covers are yeah. far from funny. Uh, but when I was thinking about it, I always felt like the funny in his books was always the inner voice of the main character or whoever you were, you know, point of view you were at at the time, uh, because it was their interpretation of the situation that they were in. And that's what made it so funny. So to counter that, I wanted to make the books feel adventurous and uh, know that you were going to go on this epic journey or quest. Um, you know, once you, once you open it up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the artwork definitely, um, helped get an idea. Um, one thing that I always do with, with, uh, with book covers, um, is that like, as I'm reading the book, I try to, uh, pick out scenes that I think might be the book cover or think about like what the book cover is trying to illustrate and how it happened, uh, in the book. Um, so, uh, right. so sometimes like I'll see the characters and be like, oh, that's this character and that's this character. And, um, this is like loosely, uh, based on this scene in the book. Um, mm -hmm. so kind of along those lines, uh, how does the whole process for creating the covers work? You know, it changed over time. Um, and the, the reason it changed over time was, that we got to a certain point, I think it was probably when he, when Rick was doing the Heroes of Olympus series and the Kane Chronicles at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he was having like a book come out in the spring and then another book come out in the fall. And he was really doing that to please his hungry fans who were eager for the next installment of whatever it was that he wrote. Um, the problem with that is that the publisher 
wanted the covers long before he had even written the book. Mm. Um, so that made it tricky, but I'll, I'll back up and say that when I first started reading the books, I always wanted to make a cover that kind of represented uh, what the story meant to me as opposed to a particular mm. scene. So for instance, in the very first cover, The Lightning Thief, you have Percy standing in the water facing uh, facing New York skyline. Uh, and it has, there's no scene in the movie, uh, in the book or the movie, or whatever. There's no scene like that. Um, and the reason I said the movie is because it was funny, the movie poster was sort of very similar to the cover, uh, <laughs> even though there's no scene in the movie either. That's where he's standing in the water facing the the uh, New York skyline. But for me, the essence of the book was about a kid stuck in the middle of an argument between two adults. Mm. And the two adults being Poseidon and uh, Zeus. Zeus. Yes. And they are fighting over who stole the, the lightning bolt. So, so for me, it was like having a lone kid on the cover standing in the water, which is Poseidon, and it's, you know, raging waves of water. Um, and then the stormy sky, and he's kind of stuck in the middle, and everything's kind of green. And, and then I used a contrasting color orange of the his t-shirt to make that pop because when you want things to kind of stand out and pop you use uh contrasting colors um so if you're looking at a color wheel and you've got you know red yellow blue uh the opposite of yellow would be in between red and blue and that would be purple so you'll notice throughout all my covers, I try to use contrasting colors and that makes them, you know, have more of a dynamic color range. Mm. So if my light colors are yellow, then I might use purples in the shadows. And and if it's green, then you've got an orange, which is the opposite on the color wheel and that'll make it pop. But to get back to your question, um, the uh, the covers themselves the first, at least the the first the Percy Jackson series, um, were all based on my sense of what is this book about? What are the what are the big elements going on here? And then when we got into later aspects of maybe um, like midway through the Heroes of Olympus series and beyond. It was more based on conversations I had with Rick and the publisher about what is this book about, or they might have a particular scene that they thought was a good uh, image for scene the cover. that they wanted so illustrated, they, yeah. Yeah, so they would send me the text for that section if Rick had it written. And then a uh, very funny scene, uh, I was illustrating the... Um, uh, House of Hades cover for Heroes of Olympus. And I wasn't sure, I kind of knew that it was going to be Percy and Annabeth and they were going to be struggling coming out of, uh, from the underworld and there was going to be the doors of death there. And Rick sent me some pictures of like what those doors might look like. Um, and I said to him, you know, I, I don't know, what are their, what are they wearing? Cause their, their clothes kind of burnt off and, uh, yeah. from what I understood and uh, but he hadn't written it yet and he said um he said just you know make make it whatever you want and then I'll just write it into the book <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of fun funny um to be involved in like you know what might be part of the story um and uh I, I loved that cover because the it's just you can't tell whether Annabeth's helping Percy walk or Percy's helping Annabeth walk. It's it's almost as if without each other, neither one of them would be able to walk out of there. 
And that was kind yeah. of the, the feeling I wanted that to have. Um, yeah, and that was like what, what the book was about. And I felt like the cover really conveyed that. Thank you. Thanks, Diego. Yeah, and especially when uh when the House of Hades came came out, I think I just like looking at the cover, I was so so worried for the characters, but also very excited to get the book. So, right. Uh, <laughs> uh, well done on that. But uh, yeah, you, you just told us about the the Lightning Thief and then the the Heroes of Olympus, and you've also been doing illustrated books and uh, Charles Apollo and Magnus Chase. So, what's it like? Sort of, I I don't think there are a lot of um artists that you can sort of name off the top of your head who have been working with one author for a long time. So what's it, what's it like having working, having been working with Rick Riordan since the, the second lightning thief cover? Right. Which was back in, I think 2006 when I started that cover. Um, so 14 years now um, it's, I mean, obviously it's been a thrilling ride, right. To be able to, sort of stamp your artwork on all of these books and and some of them have gone through and there's new art on some of the books i know there's new art on the kane chronicles books um there's new art on the paperbacks of the heroes of olympus which i didn't do i didn't do any of the character art uh, that you'll find uh, like on his website mm -hmm. or you know, across the internet, you'll find a lot of character art. I always felt like um, I didn't want to show what the characters looked like. Mm. I wanted to always keep that kind of vague because my my whole thing is I want the reader to be able to project whatever they want, you know, onto that character mm. and become that character. And that's why the first few books, you know, you might only see the characters back. And I do that for a couple of reasons. One, as I said, I, I want you to be able to project whoever you want onto that character, but also I I wanted the viewer to feel like they were following this character into the book, into the story, as opposed to the character coming out at them. Yeah. So, um, so to answer your question, uh, it's been great. It's been, you know, steady work for me as an illustrator for a long time. And it's really helped. I mean, you know, I, I make a career doing that and doing my picture books and whatever else. Um, but yeah, that's been a, a, an interesting journey. I don't know what is next for Rick. Um, honestly, I know he's doing a lot with his um, with his Rick, Rick Riordan presents, uh, books, which are doing really well. Um, you know, you know about that, that his publishing imprint. Oh yeah. We, yeah. We love yeah. yeah we've, about we've it. spoken to many of the authors as well. Um, oh, okay. We've actually spoken yeah, those... to one, one cover artist, uh, the, uh, Eric Wilkerson. He did the Tristan strong cover. Oh yeah. Those are beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He um, was. He I really was... loved that cover when I saw it. Yeah, really nice. So yeah, it's interesting with covers. Um, I I had done a bunch of covers uh, early on after I'd done the Lightning Thief for other books. Um, about fifty other books I had done the covers for over the over like a five or six year span, um, and some of them were like redos of other covers for instance i redid uh the diana Wynn jones series house of howl's moving castle and um castle in the air and house of many ways were three books in her series that i had redone the covers for and so it's a thing that you know publishers are always doing to not only to change the look of a book to maybe interest a new reader but also styles change you know and and the looks of books change over the years um if you look at the hardy boys for instance right those books have been around forever and if you look at the 1940s version of the hardy boys cover yeah it probably looks 90... very different <laughs> oh yeah and you know they're they're wearing ties and sweaters and 
sometimes wearing like a blazer running around. And then you look at, you know, the 1980s versions or the 1970s versions. So you can, you can actually see the styles change over the years, every decade. It's got kind of a different look. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's super interesting. Um, yeah. So I'm sure these books will be around forever and other artists will come and, you know, make their interpretations of the covers. But I yeah. was the first. I was the first. <laughs> well, kind of. The second, um, but... <laughs> oh, <laughs> but but the first in our eyes. Um, first in our hearts. Uh, and yeah, <laughs> in in kind of a uh, something about that. How do you how do you feel about like when authors redo your covers? And do you like, do you talk to them? Are you in contact with them? Or do you, do you simply kind of watch um, your, your work kind of be changed in some ways and different interpretations uh, of the same cover? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you know, no one, no one wants that done, right? <laughs> you want your <laughs> own art on the cover, of course, but you know, that's, that's part of the industry and how it works. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's very surprising and other times it's like, oh, okay, I get that. Um, you know, I know on the Kane Chronicles, um, the covers have a much more, almost a graphic novel feel to me, mm. um, which I like. And I think a lot of kids will be gravitating toward, toward that for sure. And it certainly distinguishes those books from his other series. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I had an interesting situation come along when they wanted to redo the original Percy Jackson covers for the mm -hmm. 10th anniversary. And and uh, those were going to come out. I don't know if they did hard cover versions, but I know they did paperback versions mm -hmm. where I created one big painting. And that was kind of a challenge because uh, I wanted... Like, I didn't even want to change the covers. I loved all the covers, but I also wanted the work, right? Yeah. So, you know, I'm not going to refuse it if they're offering it to me. Um, and so I said, well, I'm going to do one big painting that's going to go across all five covers and be an homage to the original covers, but a little bit more updated, a little bit more detail so that they're more in sync with the covers I've been doing for the Heroes of Olympus series. Yeah, that that makes that makes sense. And I think when you did redo the covers, you definitely did make them seem uh, a lot more like the Heroes of Olympus. Uh, and they they kind of flow uh, in like when you look at the covers next to each other, they, they, as opposed to because the 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 original um, Percy Jackson, although they're all great. But uh, this is kind of a, a a little unrelated to what we were just talking about, but. I wanted to, to ask about your, your most recent project, How We Got to the Moon. Uh, could you tell us a bit about uh, the, the book and uh, maybe the inspiration behind it? Sure. Um, I've always been fascinated with the Apollo moon missions. And um, the, reason, the reason is, you know, I love the idea of this, this, this grand idea, like, let's go to the moon, you know? Um, and it's the first time in our history of being humans that we've left our planet to go and stand somewhere else, you know, in the solar system. And it's, it's, it's a huge moment in our history um, that we, eh, we kind of forgot about it for a little while. Um, Glazed over it. Yeah, sort of glazed over, like, oh, okay, we went to the moon. I was like, ago. yeah, we, we, we left you, the planet. When you think about it, five, six hundred years from now, if we're still all on this planet uh, as human <laughs> beings, what is going to be the thing that we remember? You know, it, it, is it going to be, you know, 9 11? Is it going to be the COVID 19 epidemic? Or is it going to be that moment? where we left our planet and went to another planet. Um, I think that's a huge, huge stepping stone mm. as a human race, you know, in exploring our universe. Um, so I used to love to read about 
the Apollo missions. And what I found was all the books that uh, interested me or that I read, uh, a lot of them very technical. Um, mm. And especially the ones when it comes down to describing the actual engineering behind how we got to the moon. And I have a science background. My father was a scientist. I studied engineering in college. And uh, I also, you know, had some great inspirations like uh, David McCauley, uh, who was uh, sort of a, not a mentor, but a, a teacher at RISD when I was at RISD. And um, so for me, I thought, man, I, I think I could do this. I think I could take this highly technical information, boil it down to something that's understandable in kind of this, a similar way that David McCauley did with the way things work. And now he explained how mm -hmm. machines work and, and so forth. And so um, I went about doing a lot more research and figuring out what my book was going to be about. And it became not only about the engineering, but about the people who were actually doing it and not necessarily the well-known people. A lot of, you know, there were 400,000 or so people that worked on this project. And um, so I was people. able to, yeah, so I was able to reach out to um, quite a few Apollo engineers, both men and women, uh, who told me their stories and what parts of it they worked on. So that's also, besides the engineering aspect, that dictated, you know, what what this book was going to be about. Um, and I wanted to boil it down to the basic building blocks of science. So you've got physics, uh, you know, the Newton's laws, um, thermodynamics, which is how heat moves from one place to another, and, uh, and things like that. And through teaching those within the book, you can then understand how they went through and problem solved all along the way. So as you go through the book, you're gonna see like, okay, here we have the first stage of the Saturn V rocket. And here's the problem that they encountered. And here's how they solved it. And so that's how the book goes through the whole story of from Sputnik being this uh, pivotal historic event where Russia sent a satellite that actually the first man-made satellite that, that orbited the Earth um, and scared the daylights out of all Americans because we were in the midst of a Cold War, um, to landing on the moon. How did we get there? And when you think about the short span of time, you know, that was from when Sputnik got launched in 1957 uh, to 1969, when we landed on the moon. I mean, that, that's, that's that's not very long. No, it's not very long at all. Um, and when you, th I mean, and you think about even going back further, you think of uh, you know the Wright brothers and Kitty Hawk, right? I, I don't know yeah. the date off the top of my head, but I think it was like 1918 or 1908. Um, I'd have to look it up, but uh, to 1969, right? Less than, it could be 50 years uh, or less, I don't know. Um, going from, you know, first leaving the ground, we only left 10 feet off the ground, uh, besides the balloonists who were doing yeah. it a, long time, a long time ago, but actually powered flight, you know, to taking this rocket to the moon, was about 50 years Short the bicycle time. the bicycle took longer than that to develop <laughs> you know, just to get a proper that, working bicycle that's crazy and yeah. and now 50 years after the apollo moon landings and we're not even close we to haven't leaving done the planet very much yet. at all yeah <laughs> exactly. i mean we, we built the space station um that's which crazy. was which was uh it's it's you know, it's got its uh, merits for sure. And that was a huge undertaking to do that. Um, but when you think about it, the space station 
if you were to drive on a road to the space station, right, you could probably do it in about four hours. Okay. Because it's only 250 miles. Above, oh, above the above planet. Above the Earth. Yeah. Um, but if you were to drive nonstop to the moon, it would take you six months Jesus. nonstop driving. So that's crazy. There's a big difference, you know, uh, in space. Going to the moon, that's a long ways away. And you're sitting in a little tin can <laughs> hoping that it, the it engine... was very literally a little tin can. Oh, it was. It was. Uh, that's, it, that's, imagine, that's... imagine yourself <laughs> and two friends in a small car for a week. <laughs> Yeah, that you know. that doesn't. I mean, you can't roll down the window. If, <laughs> even if they were my best friends, I think after right. a little while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, it'd be, so it'd anyway, be kind of hard. yeah. So this book um, is two hundred and sixty pages, heavily, heavily illustrated. I think I did over five hundred paintings for it. Oh, yes. um, heavily researched, and um, and it comes out in October. And I'm really excited about it. That's so well, cool that after... you got to do all that like work and and, and talk to real people who uh, did uh, did the stuff that got us to the moon. Yeah, but that, yeah, that they they are all fascinating, and they're all you know in their 80s now, some in the 90s, uh, but they remember it like it was yesterday. So th that was really neat because, as I said, there's a lot of information out there, both on the internet and in books. Um, but there's some things I just couldn't quite understand, no matter how many times I read about it. I, I really needed to talk to the person who actually was involved and say, can you explain why they did this or what, you know, and, and through that process, I, under, I uncovered all these really interesting stories that you might not, you know, read about anywhere. Yeah, that's, that's, well, you can read about it in how we got to the moon. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Um, so uh, that's, that's, that's really cool. But I wanted to ask, so when it, when it comes to how we got to the moon or even, um, Marcy Jackson's Greek heroes and Greek gods, how does drawing illustrations for the inside of book differ from drawing cover art? Hmm. Um, so the first one of those big illustrated books was the Greek gods. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of had in my mind what the cover would look like. I knew, I knew, you know, what, what was going on with that. And that was, that was fairly straightforward. Um, and then doing the interiors for me, it was kind of obvious that, you know, I wanted to uh, paint all the gods that he talks about, but I also wanted to have these other sort of decorative illustrations that those long horizontal illustrations on the mm. on the edges um yeah. and also some spot illustrations at the beginning of each chapter chapter um did you do the map? uh no i did not do that map I, and i don't know why i think the publisher thought i was too busy and they decided like they wanted a map but they never asked me to do it i would have done it um <laughs> and you yeah you so you can kind of tell it's not necessarily my style um mm -hmm. you know like i did the map for the lightning thief illustrated mm. that's on the uh inside front cover i believe mm -hmm. um of you know camp half blood um but yeah i didn't do the map for the greek gods i would have liked to but you know <laughs> They got it done and it works and I, I don't honestly don't know who did it um they might be listed somewhere in the credits on the inside oh um but yeah so those those books are so much fun to illustrate uh i wish we had done many more i would have enjoyed that um each one took me probably about six four to six months uh oh, because there's about quite a while 60 or so paintings in each one, maybe more. Yeah. 
Well, you know, I mean, the art, I, I, I guess one of those big full page spread paintings would probably take me two days. Mm. Um, oh. That's, that's yeah. a lot. I mean, a lot of flex, con right? I mean, yeah, considering how many you, know, you see in in the book, a lot of them like full page. That that does sound like a lot of a lot of work and time and effort. But it, but it, oh it yeah, comes out comes out great in the book. Thanks. It it really shows. But uh, you said uh, you'd like to to do more. Is there uh, as far as you know any plans for like a late uh, a, a sea of monsters illustrated edition or something else along those lines? Well, I asked about that, and they they said no. Uh, they don't have plans to do that. Um, there was talk of a Magnus Chase potential movie. I don't know, but, you know, I don't want to spread rumors. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so I don't know if they're actually going to do that. Um, again, with the, you know, with Hollywood, it's so weird and... That's just <laughs> Especially They're when it comes to Rick Riordan. Well, yes, that's, <laughs> that's true as well. I, I know he's been in talks with Disney lately about doing like a redo of Percy Jackson, but this is just stuff that I've read, you know, I've read on the mm -hmm. internet. So I, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. I just make my books, you know. I, <laughs> I, I used to work in Hollywood and now I don't. And if anyone wants to make my books into a movie great godspeed <laughs> um but yeah i just i primarily focus on on making books and and don't pay a lot of attention to that stuff um yeah. <laughs> how we got to the moon movie coming out in <laughs> march 2021 yeah. <laughs> yeah they don't turn a lot of non-fiction books into movies but um but there is some interesting I mean, I could see a television series just on the people, mm, yeah. the people that were involved, like a documentary series. That could be cool. Yeah. You definitely see a lot of those uh, on TV and around. Um, and you you mentioned something about uh, about work in Hollywood, and you mentioned it at the beginning as well. Uh, and I kind of wanted to yeah. follow up on that. What is it that sure. you did do in Hollywood? Well, I say Hollywood. That's kind of a general term for the entertainment business. Um, I, I worked either out of my house or I worked in Glendale, California or, you know, other places. But um, I started out doing um, interactive multimedia uh, for a guy, a guy named Robert Abel. And he was, he was this visionary guy who was involved in developing 3D graphics. Oh, wow. Um, and he worked on the special effects for the, movie, the the very first movie of Tron that came out in the 70s. Um, he worked on special effects for 2001 Space Odyssey. Um, oh. And so he was doing a he was doing this thing called interactive multimedia, which at the time, no one knew too much about what that was. So from that job that I had working in interactive multimedia, I, I went on to work at a lot of different places. Um, I, I started doing, um, directing television commercials and motion graphics. Uh, then I got a job um, as an art director and then a creative director for Walt Disney Imagineering for many years. Um, and I think I worked for them for 14 years, either directly for them or as a consultant um, designing theme park attractions for Disney World and Disneyland and Epcot and all of that and then That's um, super cool and then I worked uh, at DreamWorks for a little while and was oh. a pre-production art director for Shrek but yeah so that was super cool to work on that um, I worked at a company called Digital Domain for a while and they did special effects they did the the special effects for Apollo 13 and Titanic. Well, that that must have been a dream job. Oh, they doing the special job. effects. You know what? Here's the thing: if you do what you love, it's all a dream job, right? And yeah, I I find that like every job I've had, I've enjoyed. I've enjoyed the work. I like to work. Um, making <laughs> books from home is is definitely. Takes the cake though. 
like I have to say. <laughs> uh, but I've enjoyed, you know, pretty much every job I've I've had. Um, they're all quite fun, and I'm very fortunate uh, to be able to do that. I I went to art school and I learned certain things about color and composition and storytelling that I've used in all of those jobs. Mm. Um, that's, you know, that's the one kind of link that holds them all together, whether you're designing a theme park ride uh, or a television commercial or a book, you're telling stories with images. Mm. So I guess that's, that's what connects them all. And, and that's what I enjoy doing. Well, that sounds like uh, an awesome ride. Uh, but uh, I mean, it, it's, ride and ride. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, but cir circling back for I think uh, one last uh, Percy Jackson question. Uh, you you mentioned er earlier uh, that you you had to kind of adjust the the Percy Jackson books on the tenth anniversary to be more like the Heroes of Olympus uh, style. So when when you go for each each different series uh, of Rick Ricks, do you do you try to go for um like a different art style or, or style of image when you're going from series to series? Uh, I I think so. I mean, you know, the word style kind of sticks on my tongue a little bit because I I don't necessarily think in terms of style. Um, I do have sort of a different approach. I knew, for instance, when I was doing uh, the covers for Magnus Chase, um, I, you know, I, I did one at a time, so I wasn't doing all three at once. Mm -hmm. I, I sort of did the first one and said, okay, I'm going to base the others on this one. And so all three of those covers have a lot of similarities. For mm -hmm. instance, you have yeah. you have Magnus sort of on the cover. I know the first one had the tree. Uh, yeah, with the wolf. With the wolf. And um, the second one, I think, had the hammer. Yeah, 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 yeah. you had the hammer okay, on I'm the front. And then... I'm looking at and then the third one has a boat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, you've the got boat the, with the main Magnus character, something big behind him, some sort of atmosphere. Um, Loki's always, evil face. Yeah, and there's always sort of a a, um, a somewhat of a Celtic design element, mm. whether it's the uh, whether it's the shields on the ship or the swirls in the fur of the um, the wolf. Oh, in the waves. Designs in the hammer. Yeah, there's always some sort of Celtic design. So those covers, I think. You know, work really well together, but they also worked when they were side by side with the with the Heroes of Olympus series. You know, you you could look at them and go, these are all from the same world. Yeah. Mm, yes. Which and kind of see like the connection between them. Right. Yeah. Um. I think uh, now that we're on a COVID nineteen corner. Um, uh, how have you been like dealing with, uh, with, with the virus and how has it affected like you working from home? Well, I, you know, I worked from home before the virus. So for <laughs> me, I, honestly, for me, nothing's changed except my wife is, is home every day as well. Cause she's working from home now too. So that's nice. We have lunch together. Um, and, uh, I think that this, this whole thing, you know, it's, it's obviously a major disaster. So yeah. many people are dying from it. Uh, a lot, but it's making us, it's, it's forcing us to think globally. I think, uh, -huh. uh, you know, we, we lived in a world for so long where people just, all they cared about was how many likes and, you know, <laughs> How many? Uh, it was all focused on their phone and themselves, mm -hmm. right? I mean, in general, and we're all guilty of it. I'm guilty of it too. Um, but suddenly, we have to think about the world, mm -hmm. not just our country, but the world. You know, mm -hmm. and 
and we all have to work together to, to get through this. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that out of this comes uh, a new, a new sort of understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, John, for joining us and talking about Percy Jackson and the moon and, uh, and coronavirus and every, er, everything else and in between. Um, to, to our listeners, make sure to get How We Got to the Moon. Uh, John, uh, your website, your social media, anything people should know about, about how to find you on the internet? Sure. Uh, my website is rockoart.com, which is R-O-C-C-O-A-R-T.com. Um, I've got information there where you can pre-order the book. Uh, and see my other books and paintings and what have you. Um, I think on Instagram, I'm Rocco Art, I believe. And uh, yeah, I'm not the biggest social media person, but I'm trying to get better at it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries. So yeah, thank you guys. This has been a, a blast. It's it's great to meet both of you. Um, and good luck with your podcast. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Great. All right. Thanks. Um, yeah, well, thank you guys. We love chatting and you are a very interesting person uh, with a lot of things. And I definitely um, some other time want to hear more, but we'll save that for another time. Thanks so much okay. for being on the podcast. Right. Absolutely. Thanks, Thank you, John. Guys. It was a blast. Bye. And that's it for this episode of the Half-Blood Report. Samuel, where can I contact this podcast? You can find us on Twitter, where we are most active, at Half Report. Yeah, make sure to tweet at us with compliments, questions, corrections, or suggestions. You can also find us on Instagram at the Half Blood Report or email us uh, at the Half Blood Report at gmail the Half Blood Report at gmail dot com. We also have a website the Half Blood Report dot com, um, and uh, also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Uh, that said, it's time for credits. Our theme music is actually by me. I do most of our editing, and our recording equipment is on loan from William Fox. My co-host here is Samuel, and I'm Diego. This is the Half Blood report podcast the only hbr that matters we'll see you next week hi my name is john rocco and i'm the illustrator of many of the rick rarden percy jackson and the olympians magnus chase uh, trials of apollo book jackets and other books and uh i you know i don't listen to the half-blood report i mean who would <laughs>